But I'm under no illusions, despite that energy, all of you have left things behind this morning on your desk. All of you have got things that are vying for your attention on your phone. All of you have got little leadership challenges and things that you'll have to get back to later on. So let's make a promise that I don't want to burden you with more problems. I actually want to make your life a little bit easier this morning as well and try and simplify a few things about leadership, about talent, and about that magic number 10,000 days. But let's just check I'm in the right room, first of all. Can I just have a show of hands? Any leaders here at all? It's actually all of us, okay? Because we lead through our disposition, not our position, not our title. A leader is simply anyone who has any degree of influence to make you do something else. So we are all leaders. And that gives us a great power, but also a great responsibility as well. Now, about two weeks ago, we clicked over into a new decade. I want to ask you to think about 20 years ago, the millennium, all of the Fortune 500 companies that existed then, 20 years later today, how many of them still exist? What percentage do you think? 10? 60? 70? Maybe more? 50. 50%. 50 percent. 50 percent of them have disappeared been merged into other entities, ceased to be relevant. So despite the high levels of engagement that you have here, despite all the progress that you're making, our challenge as leaders is to maintain relevance and to maintain respect in the market as well. Now, there was a major study done about all of those companies that have disappeared, and this was one of the key conclusions. The speed and the thoughtfulness of how businesses respond in the digital era will determine their future. Now, the speed is one thing, but what I really like about that is the thoughtfulness. And the thoughtfulness is a soft skill. The thoughtfulness is what you do as leaders and what you make in terms of the team and the environment that you create around you. And what keeps these CEOs up at night? Well, it won't surprise you that over 60% of those worries and let's be honest, there are things that keep all of us up at night. Over 60% relate to people. Finding the right people and then persuading them to stay. And what we're conditioned to think is it's very simple, isn't it? Your talent is based on your skills and your experience. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to challenge that and say that formula is wrong. And I will show you the correct formula in about 10 minutes' time. But let's just lighten the mood with a nice picture of New Zealand instead. That's much easier, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> now, this is my son. This was taken last week, and he would be absolutely, totally embarrassed to know that he's up here now. So please take a photo and share that widely on social media. Tag him, Joseph McCulloch. Um, he'll love that. Um, so this was last week. We had this wonderful road trip around the South Island of New Zealand as a family. T total sort of dis digital disconnect and to spend time in these beautiful surroundings. And please, that's important balance we all need as leaders. And we need to instill that in our teams as well. But New Zealand is known for this beautiful scenery. Okay? And it's also known for kiwi fruit. Okay. Absolutely. We have it on everything, including pizza, would you believe? Um, but it's also known for innovation. We are one of the most remote countries in the world. I'm going to leave here this afternoon to fly back to New Zealand, and it will take 19 hours from leaving this building to arriving home in Wellington tomorrow. Various flights, various transfers, it's a long, long way. Now, what that means is that when we have challenges in New Zealand, we have to innovate ourselves. We have to get on with these things. We have a great spirit of simplicity and ingenuity in the country, and that drives our leadership style as well. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But I also want to talk to you about this number. Where do we spend, whether we like it or not, 10,000 days of our lives? Where do you think? Working, office, okay. Now as I look around this room, and I'm not gonna guess anyone, anyone's ages, but I would guess that we're all at various stages in that 10,000-day journey, okay? Some of us, 
starting out, some of us getting towards the end of that journey. That's great. I'm on about day five and a half thousand, by the way. Um, when I do this talk, and sometimes I do it to groups of, of millennials or graduates, they get very depressed about this number. 10,000 days. Oh, okay. Um, when I do it to groups who are about to retire, they're pretty happy. They're nearly done. Um, but the point is, where we spend 10,000 days of our lives has a huge impact on our well-being. And if you think about that for a moment, think about the best job you've ever had, I'm sure it's right now, and think about the worst job you ever had before you came to TM, and the impact that that had on your life. And in all seriousness, when we try and compartmentalize these things and say, it's only work, that's okay, I've still got my weekends, I've still got my evenings, I've got my family, I've got my community activities, think about it and be honest. That stuff, if you have a poor workplace, a poor culture, a bad boss, that stuff influences every area of your life. So as you think about your role as a leader and trying to nurture that talent, that's what we need to really think about. Now, I've had some roles all over the world. I've been very lucky. I've worked as a CEO in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, worked in many different countries. And I'll give a few book recommendations as I go. This one is great. It's called It's Tough at the Top. But really, the conclusion is that leadership is hard, okay? And there will be tough days, but if we absolutely have a growth mindset, we can learn from those tough days, okay? They make us stronger. It doesn't seem like it at the time. And now at Inspire, we have a simple ethos, which is better learning is life-changing. So we're a New Zealand company operating in 38 countries all over the world. And that gives us this unique helicopter view of helping lots of organizations, big and small, to get better at leadership and talent all over the world. All sorts of names there, some you'll recognize from Malaysia, some global. This one I want to come back to, Spark, as some of you might know, Spark is Telecom New Zealand. So our national telecom provider, we've worked with them for 15 years, all sorts of different tips and tricks that we've helped them with over the years as well. And we're part of a huge industry. Leadership development, training, talent, culture, engagement. I can tell you that somewhere in the world today, four new books will be released about a management style, a theory about the future of work, a theory about engagement. Most of them will be a complete waste of time. There'll be many TED Talks uploaded today. And there'll be, this year, 55 billion US dollars spent on training and development. And I have to share with you, and I work in this industry, most of it is a complete waste of time. And it must be, because the world is not full of great leaders. And why does that even matter? Well, it matters because of this. Gallup. StrengthsFinder, 25 million different data sets from all over the world about what makes a fully engaged workforce, what makes a great leader, what makes a retained workforce, how do you retain talent? This is the conclusion. If you give the wrong person that title of leader, it doesn't matter what you do. You can have great offices, great environments, you can have energizing starts to conferences, but at the end of the day, it's a poor job. And it takes that takes into your own life as well. The biggest impact on your health and happiness is the quality of your relationships. And if you think about that for a moment, think back to that worst job you ever had. It might be okay because of the people. I stayed in it, the job was pretty tough, but I loved the people. And think about other jobs you may have had where it was a good job, it was everything you ever wanted, but I just couldn't work with those people. I just had a boss I just couldn't get on with. It just really got to me. So it really is all about the people. And even more seriously than that, look at this one from the Mayo Clinic in the States. Okay, this person, your leader, if they're in the room, they're pretty important to your health as well. You're certainly seeing them more often, or I hope you are, than the family doctor. So what a great responsibility we carry as leaders to nurture that talent. And you know what, there's a bit of a problem. And I'm convinced this is not here, Farid, by the way, but just let me say that in the workplace, and I've worked in all these different countries, work is basically horrible. Okay, I've got to share with you. Not here, not here. But, and this is your opportunity, about 80% of people generally are quite disengaged in the world of work. They're secretly looking for a new job while they're there. 30 to 40% of us 
will experience or witness some form of bullying. In the States, recent study, three out of 10 people would forego a pay rise just to see their boss fired, okay? So this stuff is pretty serious. And this is your opportunity, because if you can be an employer of choice, if you can maintain that relevance, what an attractive proposition that makes you as well. And as I said, training and development doesn't always solve it. Only about 35% of training and development really sticks. Harvard did another study, only about 7% is best in class. Okay, and there's some reasons for that which I'll share with you in a moment as well. And the other reason is that most of the leadership models that we've been taught actually don't help us because they don't take into account one of our biggest things that gets in the way, which is ego, okay? All of our different views as leaders. And look at this one. The higher you get, the more senior you get, the less likely it is that people are telling you what's really going on because they want to say that you're right. Nothing is as flattering as someone telling you you're right, okay? So Leadership BS is a great book that deconstructs a lot of the modern theory about leadership. Even more seriously than that, this was his follow-up, which is even more depressing, the impact on health and well-being, not just on you, but on your family, is considerable, okay? So there was a recent gathering of a thousand top CEOs in the US. Healthcare professionals gathered them together and said, you, all of you, are responsible for the healthcare crisis in the US at the moment because the workplace is slowly killing people, okay? Not from accidents, we've got a lot better at that sort of stuff, but from workplace-related stress and illness and well-being. So this stuff is very important. And I want you to remember this quote, because I'll share with you, and I've got some of my team in the front row here, so it's not them I'm gonna talk about, but I can share with you that I work with lots of people all over the world, some of them I really love being with, okay? Great colleagues, it's great, it's really easy to get on with them, they're you know, very aligned to what I think. Some of them, not, okay? I'm sure that's the same for all of us in this room. There's certain people that we just gel with and there's some people that we really struggle with. But you know what? No one really comes to work to be deliberately difficult, okay? All of us have things that are going on in our own lives before we've even got to work. And a great question that I'd like you to ask when you think about talent, when you think about leadership, when you think about nurturing your team, is what's really going on here? What's really going on for that member of staff? What's really going on for that individual who's turned up to work a bit late, looking really tired? You don't know what they've gone through even to get to work. The sick elderly family member they've been looking after all night the challenges they're having with their children, whatever those things are. And our role as leaders is to take an interest in that and be aware of that and see that whole person. But the other problem is that leadership is incredibly complicated, isn't it? Is that right? Complicated thing? Well, it must be. Look, there's 32.7 million ways to be a great leader. And I've read every single one of them. I can, no, I haven't really. Okay. <laughs> I travel a lot on planes, okay? So 32.7 million ways to be a great leader. So it's already very confusing. And in this new multi-generational workforce that we have, wow, it's even more difficult, isn't it? That's what we're conditioned to think. Okay, well, give me a show of hands. Anyone here who's got children? It's pretty much all of us, okay? Now, I've got two boys. You've seen one of them already. They're 18 months apart, okay? They were both born in the same place, brought up together. I've just spent three weeks with them traveling around in a car, and I can tell you they are so different in terms of their personality, okay? My brother is two years younger than me. I've just spent a lot of time with him. He's so different as well. I'm sure it's the same for your brothers and your sisters and your children as well. And all those people are the same generation, but they're different because their personalities are different. So I want you to be really wary of sweeping generalizations about this generation needs that, that generation needs that. There are some nuances, there are some differences, but you know what? What we need is what we always needed. Fairness, challenge, reward, enjoyment, psychological safety, the freedom to be ourselves. How we do that is slightly different, of course, but that's what we need. 
And of course, the employees themselves have evolved. The working day has changed. The distractions have changed. And what that means, by the way, in terms of enhancing talent is it's even more difficult. On average now, you can work in an office for about 91 seconds before you're interrupted. That's the global average. Interrupted by a person, interrupted by a beep on your phone, interrupted by an email, interrupted by a distraction, okay, interrupted by colleagues. So that's the challenge that we have. So I would contend that the earlier formula is incorrect. It's actually this, isn't it? It is. Can you get a photo? Would you mind getting a photo of this, please? Because I'm going to share this with someone. Um, talent, of course, is your skills and experience, but massively multiplied by attitude. And attitude is determined by the culture, by your well-being, by the leader that you have, by the place that you work. And what this means, ladies and gentlemen, it means that someone can have a high level of skill, some pretty great experience, but have a low level of value to the organization because their attitude is not great. Or, even worse, they came here with a great attitude and somehow you managed to take that away because of the leadership that they experienced or the learning that they experienced. So this is something to be very aware of. Okay, so I've painted quite a depressing picture so far and it's not what I promised at all, did I? I promised uh, simplification. I promised you to make your life easier and at the moment you're thinking, 10,000 days, I've got this huge responsibility as a leader. Oh my goodness, if I get it wrong, I'm not just impacting them, I'm impacting their families as well. Oh, I've still got another five and a half thousand days to go myself. Okay, so there must be a simpler, easier way. And actually, you know what there is. This notion of the one thing is incredibly powerful. And some of you, as you walked in, will have noticed a card. Some of you have got that card and others will pick it up on the way out. What is the one thing you can do to make everything else easier or unnecessary? It's all about simplifying. And we'll do an exercise on this in a moment as well. The other principle I'd like you to think about is simplify. And simplify is a great book, by the way. Simplify deconstructs some of the most successful businesses in the world, how they've simplified every process and got better at it. And of course, many of you will be familiar with this concept as well. Where we want to operate is that, that intersection. Okay, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, what you love. Well, let me share with you that we've developed, I think, about 21,000 leaders now in 31 different countries, 38 different places. And what we've found is that leadership comes down to just three things. So not 32.7 million, just three things. That's it. If you want to be a great leader, if you want to enhance your own talent, if you want to enhance the talent of your team, if you want to grow at TM, if you want to grow TM, this is what you need. Now, of course, most of us in this room will be very familiar with growth mindset. Simply the ability to see a setback or a mistake as a bit of learning, a way not to do it next time. Leading yourself before you lead others is about having balance. Remember I described my so-called digital detox I took in the South Island of New Zealand. I tried to do that, trying to disconnect and be with my family. But you know what? The most important leadership skill of all is to direct and inspire. And if you think about it, that's all a leader does. They provide direction, they provide inspiration. Now, if you just do one of those things, it's no good. Okay, and you think about some leaders you've had who've just given you great direction, but no inspiration. Even worse, they've inspired you, they're really fired up, but you haven't got a clue what to do with all that energy, okay? So direct and inspire. And here's the little secret. There's only one way that we direct and inspire people, and it is the hardest skill of all, conversation, okay? Now, as we came into this room, I didn't notice anyone having a problem with conversation, okay? When you were having your breakfast, when we were doing the energizer, the energy was there. But for some reason, when we go back into our role as leaders, and when we have to have coaching conversations or performance conversations, suddenly conversation is one of the most scary words in the world. And it doesn't have to be, but it just takes practice. So how can we make those 10,000 days better? How can we go from where you are at the moment, which is a pretty great place in terms of engagement, and go even higher? Well, here's a few tips. 
First of all, the context really matters. Now, I said that most leadership, most training, most talent management initiatives fail. And they fail because they're not contextualized to the culture to the environment, to the wider world, to the transformation that Malaysia is going through. So contextualize. And how do you do that? Well, I'm going to let you into an even simpler secret. You do that by asking people. And you do that by asking people in a fun way. You don't just send out an online questionnaire. You get people together and you engage them and you ask them. And then you do it again until you get there. The other thing you need to think about in any training that you develop is keeping it real. I don't think there's any sense in having hypothetical case studies or examples from another made up organization. Deal with the challenges that you're facing now at TM when you gather people together for real leadership conversations. And the way that we do that is quite simple and you can download some of these from our new website which is launching next week, conversation cards, okay? to actually prompt conversation with your team and to get this sort of energy flowing as well. And the other area that's missed is results. And I'm not talking now about when you get to the end of this conference, whether the food was great, whether it went on too long or too short, though those things are important. I'm talking about what difference it made to you as a leader tomorrow, next week, Next month, what did you do differently? And that's what you need to measure. And when we think about ROI, this is one of the most important indicators. The measure of your culture, the measure of your talent, the measure of how you're enhancing yourself as leaders is by the quality of the problems the HR team are facing. And what I mean by that is high quality, really challenging issues being pushed up, not, oh, that person's late for the third time, what do I do? Well, you deal with it, you're the leader. So, you deal, so a great leader is dealing with all those things and really giving the HR team something. I hope, Farad, you're going to be enjoying these challenges. Um, he's nodding, definitely. I think he's smiling. I can't see. <laughs> Hidden behind his mask. Okay, so the quality of those problems. And the way that we did this, and here's an example from Spark New Zealand, is you deal with the compliance issues in a much more fun way. Okay, security and IT security, it's a big deal here, big deal for us as well. No one's really interested in reading compliance documents, but they will play a retro game and they will have competition amongst themselves about that. And this one won us a few awards as well. And remember how we learn. Now, if I'm very lucky, tomorrow you'll remember that I lived in New Zealand and 10,000 days perhaps, and he showed a photo of his son, New Zealand looks nice. Um, if we spent more time together, you know, we would talk about some leadership challenges, we'd practice some conversation together. If we spent even longer together, we'd actually get into some real issues and I'd come back and see you, we do action learning, and that's how we learn. And if you think about anything else that you're learning in your life at the moment, and you may just be learning the best way to get to work, to avoid the traffic, uh, the best place to go near here to get lunch, okay? All of those things we learn subconsciously every single day. But you know what we do? We curate our own blended learning and we don't even think about it. We ask a peer, that's peer learning. We Google it. We want to learn something, we go on YouTube, we watch a video of it, okay? We curate our own blended learning. And we do it in bite-sized ways because we don't want it too much and we do it when we want it. So we do it on demand. But again, when we come into the world of work, we somehow think that we should drop everything onto one day workshops or big immersions and it will change culture. And it won't. And focus as well on what we need now. The thing about the future of work is it's already happened. It's already happening. These are the skills that we need. Some of them are the skills we always needed. If I was here 20 years ago, I might not have talked about collaboration. I would have talked about teamwork. Okay? So yes, there are changes happening in the outside world. The way that we're doing the work is different, but the skills, skills are what they are. And again, for Spark, we did this about five years ago. We recognized that most of their agents, call center agents, were actually part-time and wanted to work at different times of the day. So why couldn't they work at home? Why couldn't we set them up to work at home? And so all of their infrastructure was put in the cloud and they had this and drew it down from home. And you had working mothers who were doing two-hour shifts, sometimes in the middle of the night when it suited them to do that, 
and it completely revolutionized the way that their workforce was dispersed across New Zealand. And the way that we consume learning, of course, has changed completely. And if you ask about the future of learning, I would just say it's personal, it's portable, and it's in your hand right now. Okay? When you need help with a challenge, it's about five minutes before you have that difficult conversation. And it starts, by the way, it starts way before they join here. It starts when they first think about joining TM. It starts when a colleague or a friend says to them, hey, my job's really great, you should come here as well. Okay, and by the way, that's the measure of a great culture. If you've got staff members enthusiastically sharing stories on social media about something they did at work, or we did this cool training thing, or here's this new thing we've got at work, that's when you know you've got that great culture. So what can that look like? Well, very sadly, it can still look like this, okay? This is an example we came across not that long ago, not in Malaysia, not in Malaysia, okay? Some people still think that e-learning has to look a little bit like this and has to be hard and difficult and something you have to endure. Not at all, okay? It can look beautiful. It can be engaging because the biggest competitor to mobile learning is Instagram, is Facebook, everything else that's vying for your attention on your phone, everything else that you'd rather be looking at than doing this module that you have to do by tomorrow because we've got to tick a box, okay? So make it as engaging as that, if not more so. But despite that, I would say the future of learning is analog, analog 3D, what we're all doing today. I could have sat back in New Zealand in that lovely surroundings and perhaps done sort of video call and it would have been fine. You would have sat back at your desk. You might have enjoyed a bit of it. You would have pretended to listen while she did some other work, but it wouldn't have been the same. And there's a reason that we gather together so early in the year for these sort of events. It's for the sharing, it's for the connection, it's for the friendships that we'll make and the, the deep networking as well. So this sort of stuff will always be very, very important. But it can be gamified. It can be made to be more fun but not just digitally, analog. We're doing a lot of these board games now for lots of different companies because people want to gather together for real. It can be animation as well. We do this a lot. And when it comes to induction and comes to onboarding, make it fun because there are things you have to know when you join TM, but why shouldn't it be fun? Why shouldn't it be quests? Why shouldn't it be games? Why shouldn't there be a little bit of competition as well and make it something you actually want to do and want to learn? And then best of all, you proudly share it and that's when the next wave of talent comes into TM because you've shared it with your friends. And let's take the rule book and simplify it as well. No one is really going to want to wade through some of the compliance and procedural stuff that they have to unless you do it in a more fun way. So that's one thing, but there's something I've missed out and there's something pretty important. And if you think about 10,000 days and you think about what the most important thing in the world is, it is well-being, okay? Our well-being, our attitude, remember the formula, determines exactly the talent, the contribution that we're going to make. So let's have another picture of New Zealand because I like it and I miss it. Um, this is actually where I live. So this, uh, this lovely heart-shaped lagoon, I live near here. Ulrika has been down to visit me and my family. We've walked just around that, you remember that? Um, but yep, New Zealand is beautiful, okay? So that's what everyone thinks. We're very blessed to live in New Zealand. Surely everyone must be very happy every single day in New Zealand because it's so beautiful. I'm afraid it's not the case. So we have some real challenges in New Zealand with well-being. We have challenges with isolation. We have challenges with the economics of certain communities where industry has disappeared, particularly in remote areas in our southern island. So we have some real challenges to work through. And what that means is that we have some ideas about well-being as well. And I can show you what well-being isn't. It's not yoga, okay? So my heart sinks. We get asked to go into organizations, oh, we want to do more well-being. We're thinking about introducing lunchtime yoga. It's great, okay? But it's not really going to solve the underlying issue. What about another one? Fruit. We're going to give them fruit. 
That will make everything okay and make everyone happy. Mm, maybe, okay. What about we'll get some bean bags and throw them around the place and make ourselves look like Google, okay? Surely that will make it a great place to work. No. The actual secret to well-being in the world of work is about conversation, about listening. Remember what I said before? What's really going on? Having that understanding that the bit of the colleague that you see at work is only that sort of tip of the iceberg. So we have to understand what's really going on for us all. And that, for me, is how the future of work is quite exciting. Now, we did this for SEEK in Australia, a really nice piece of mobile learning to look at unconscious bias and conscious bias as well, because that determines how confident we feel having conversations about mental health, which is a difficult conversation for a leader to have. And we did this for our government as well, looking at emotional agility and doing it in the game as well. So they would actually engage with it and want to understand where, they, where their EQ was at the moment as well. So I would say there's only two things that you need to have well-being in the world of work. And hopefully all of them have here already. First of all, a role with purpose. And what I would describe that as is what I would say the kitchen table test, okay? When you go home tonight, something you've done today, something about your role has some degree of purpose, something you'd be proud to share with friends or family. We do this thing and it's making this difference. Okay, that's good. A role with purpose. I know what I'm doing. But a role with purpose is not enough. Remember what I said about it being all about the people? The second one is social connection. And this is what we have to be so aware of in this digitally changing world of work is isolation. Remember I said that we're selling more analog board games than digital games at the moment because people want to come together and they want to reconnect. So all you need to think about to nurture this talent and retain them at TM, role with purpose and a role with social connection. And social connection, by the way, is the reason that we all came together today. Okay, we need that and we want that as humans. And number three, that's it, okay? That's all you need, those two things. So the three rules there. Now, I want us to do a little bit of an exercise. I'm going to need some help with this. So my team are there standing by. Let's go back to this number because it's very tempting, isn't it, that you hear these talks and you're going to hear some great speakers today and you'll go back with some ideas and you say, yeah, I must, do, I must think about that. I must think about uh, role with purpose. I'll do that. Okay. Um, I must think about having better quality conversations with my team. I guarantee what will happen as you go back to your desk, other things will have happened and other things will get in the way. So we need to find a way to make that easier for you right now. And we need to apply this thinking, the one thing. So as you came in, some of you had a card. And those of you that haven't, that's fine. You grab one on the way out. That's yours to keep. I want you to keep that. I want you to put that on your desk and remember it. And all I want you to do for the next five minutes or so with a partner or in a group of two or three is to think about, based on what I've said, remember, leadership just comes down to direction and inspiration, the quality of the conversations you're having, the future of work, slightly simpler than we're led to believe, well-being is the secret to that formula, isn't it, as well? So what's the one thing that you can do from now, from the coffee break, to make everything else a little bit easier or unnecessary? And it might be really simple. It might be, but you know, I'm going to go home half an hour earlier every day because I want to just make sure I see my kids when they come in from school and I want to have that connection. I'm going to schedule a weekly conversation with that staff member that's a bit difficult and I always avoid them. I'm going to have that conversation. I'm going to do that thing. It can be as big or as small as you like. The great thing is it's yours, okay? But I want you to make that commitment and share it with someone as well. So I'm going to give you about five minutes. Is that okay? Go. Keep thinking about those one things. And remember, and we've heard some great ones there, they're not big. They're not big projects that will take lots of planning and it'll take me a few days before I do it. They start today, okay? And these are the little adjustments, micro adjustments we can make in our life that have a massive difference to us, our team, but you know what, more importantly, our family 
and our loved ones and our friends outside of work as well. So I've shared with you this morning lots of different things. And here's the extra good news for you as well. All of these things I've been talking about, the examples and the inspiration and ebooks and so on, are all available on our website, inspiregroup.co.nz. From next week, it'll be Inspire Group Asia, but you'll get a message about that. Um, you can see ebooks, you can see uh, award case studies, you can see how we've helped other organizations with talent management and leadership as well. But remember that quote right from the beginning. It's not just about the speed, and the speed with which you're operating at is really inspiring, by the way. It's about the thoughtfulness. It's about the soft skills. It's about the being present, perfect, um, which will really determine your future as well. And with that, let me just share with you the only two or three things you need to think about. Course communication, but most importantly, conversation. The measure of your engagement and your speed of progress is by the quality of the conversations and the challenging conversations you're prepared to have as leaders in nurturing talent and attracting talent, and sometimes in dealing with the opposite of that, which is dealing with poor performance as well. And through that, collaboration just accelerates. So listen, engage, and inspire. Thank you very much.